Well, howdy, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to History Class Live from the backyard here. Uh, it's early in the morning, uh, so I figured I'd go outside because it's already semi-nice, which means it's probably going to be miserable by the afternoon, and uh, so I figured I'd get some outside time while I can. Uh, today we are going to talk about the emergence of new nations in Africa and Asia after World War II. <coughs> and if you remember going into the world wars that the European powers had colonized the vast majority uh, of the continent of Africa and uh, quite a substantial portion of the continent of Asia as well. Um, when it comes to uh, the end of World War II, countries like Britain and France are not going to have any longer the budget, the resources uh, to maintain vast overseas empires. And in addition to that, there's also kind of an increasing moral question about whether it was even right for them to have said empires. So uh, European imperialism is more or less going to come to an end at the end of World War II. It's going to unfold slowly. Not everyone gets their independence in 1945. Uh, some get it pretty quickly. Um, but others it takes until the early 1960s. But regardless, over the 20-year period from the end of World War II to about 1965, maybe you want to stretch it a little further and say until 1970, over that 20, 25-year period, you have uh, just about 100 new countries in the world because all these um, lands that had been a part of these mass overseas empires uh, wind up getting their own uh, self-government. Um, Unfortunately, you know, it's like uh, the winning independence for a lot of these countries was kind of a good news, bad news situation because good news, you got self-determination and self-control over your country, which is a big deal. You're not trying to be ruled by, you know, you're not in uh, Africa trying to be ruled by people in London who have no connection to, to where you're at, you know, so that's a good thing. The bad news is a lot of these countries gain independence at a time when socialism and communism were uh, trendy ideas, and uh, therefore a lot of these countries adopted one or the other of those things. Of course, communism is just the, the most extreme form of socialism. And as a result, a lot of these countries got economically off on the wrong foot. Uh, and uh, so uh, the countries, uh, these countries that uh, emerged... Um, the, there's a there's a way of speaking. It's a little outdated now, but th there was a way of speaking that was common in the uh, 70s through early 2000s, probably, of talking about the uh, first world, second world, and third world. What that meant, the first world meant basically the Western democracies, America, Western Europe, Canada, and then the second world was the communist world, R Russia and China and their allies, and then the third world was uh, were these kind of tiny countries that were typically poor uh, and uh, were not necessarily aligned directly with either the West or uh, the communist bloc. Uh, and a lot of these third world countries became Cold War hotspots. We've already talked about some of them, like, you know, the fighting in Vietnam, whether it was going to become communist or pro-Western. Um, and, and there were many other places like that. So uh, the phrase the third world uh, refers to these kind of these countries that tended to be poor and so forth. Um, and a lot of the third world countries have dealt with certain specific issues of one, oftentimes widespread corruption. Um, that's been a major thing holding back uh, some of these parts of the world. Um, uh, s some of them dealing with the fact that their economies were distorted by centuries of being oriented around the good of the colonial power. Um, so uh, you know, we talked about how when, you know, the, the European imperialists came in, that you know, they um, sometimes would displace uh, goods in favor of uh, cash crops, or, you know, and so uh, they, they valued cash crop over, you know, feeding the local population at times. Uh, but in reality, uh, you know, there's some mixed feelings. If I had been in one of these countries, I probably would have had a little bit of mixed feelings about independence because... Um, I would have probably welcomed independence at the time, but then you see some of some of the countries have had turbulent histories since their independence. Um, others of them have actually wound up doing pretty well for themselves. So we'll kind of look at um, how this goes. Probably the the most important of these dominoes to fall is India. Uh, if you remember, you know India uh, had been British territory for a couple hundred years, either directly or indirectly through the British East India Company. Um, 
And uh, the Brits obviously had, uh, you know, they considered India to be the crown jewel of the British Empire. Uh, you uh, have this increasing push toward independence uh, that we've addressed before. Uh, you know, the, there was a, a, an initial push towards it with the Sepoy Rebellion in the late 1800s and then, and then uh, before World War II with the um, public uh, campaign of Gandhi. And uh, <clears throat> despite the best efforts of Gandhi and everyone winning a lot of sympathy, uh, India is not able to get their independence until after the war is over. Now, it is possible, I suppose, that um, the war kind of distracted Britain. They're not going to give up an empire that can produce potential soldiers while they're trying to fight the Germans. So uh, that was perhaps part of it. But um, regardless, after World War II, there's been enough uh, sympathy gained for India, and there's enough of... Um, a question mark in England about whether they can continue to um, maintain overseas empire that they uh, ultimately allow for uh, Indian independence. And Indian independence uh, begins in uh, officially in 1946. Uh, however, uh, there are a couple of problems brewing in India. India was a majority, was and still is a majority Hindu nation, but at the time they had a very, very large Muslim minority. Now they still have a, a decent sized Muslim minority, but uh, at the time they had, um, I believe it was, uh, I believe your book said it was uh, kind of a three and a half to one ratio. Yeah, so they had 350 million Hindus, they had 100 million Muslims. Uh, and uh, the leading uh, political party in India was called the, the Congress Party, uh, and they were explicitly Hindu. Uh, they didn't particularly welcome Muslims, and they represented Hindu interest more than Muslim interest. Uh, and so, um, <clears throat> so you started to have Muslim groups organizing that were trying to represent the Muslims more. And there gets to be a lot of domestic political turmoil between the Hindu and Muslim factions. That hadn't always been the case in the Indian independence movement. If you remember, the Sepoy mutiny involved, uh, you know, both. The uh, Gandhi's campaign involved both. Uh, but now you're starting to see uh, more tensions emerge between the, the Hindus and Muslims as India gets closer to independence. Um, and it's and there's enough actual violence begins to take place that Britain realizes um, that probably uh, the best thing, or they come to the opinion anyway, that the best thing that they could do might be to separate them. So what they do, most of the British Muslims were in two parts of the country, uh, one in the uh, northwest and the other in the southeast. So they made the Muslim part into one country and called it Pakistan. And uh, they divided Pakistan into West Pakistan, uh, which was the Northwest, and East Pakistan, which was um, the Southeast. And understand that the distance that East and West Pakistan do not touch, and not only do they not touch, but they are also very far away. Um, you know, uh, it would be, you know, many days of travel to get from East Pakistan to West Pakistan. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, so they, they are not, that, you know, they are not close together geographically at all. So, uh, so anyway, so this is the idea, the idea of partition, of the Hindus keep the core of, of India, and then these, these two Muslim regions become the nation of Pakistan. Uh, and from there, they have to determine, though, which of these new nations is getting what resources. Uh, and um, in particular, uh, one thing about this is if you were a... Indian Muslim who happened to live in the Hindu part or a Pakistani Hindu that happened to live in, in the Muslim part, uh, you know, you were going to be kind of in a bad way more than likely uh, if, uh, if you stayed. So what happens is there's a mass migration where basically most of the Muslims of India move to one of the two corners that became Pakistan. Most of the Hindus of what became Pakistan had to move into the center of the country. So you've got millions of people displaced and in the process, and they're literally fighting, they have to divide every military base, uh, 
you know, that your book mentions every paperclip. I mean, every piece of government property had to be partitioned between one country or the other. These became tense negotiations. It didn't always stay peaceful. And then what happens is while people are on this uh, mass migration trail, uh, you wind up with uh, a lot of religious violence breaking out between these different groups. So, uh, in particular, um, there were... Um, and of course, the Sikhs were kind of left out in the cold because they didn't get any place, and so they, they had to. Uh, most of them wound up with, in India, uh, but so Muslims started killing a lot of the Sikhs that were going to India. Uh, Hindus and Sikhs both started killing Muslims who were headed into Pakistan, um, and so it just turned into a mess. And so Gandhi, whose nonviolence uh, had been such a big part of the Indian independence movement, when he actually sees independence coming, someone asked him, you know, what do you, you know, how do you feel now that India's gotten their independence? And, and Gandhi said, I see nothing to celebrate. I see nothing but rivers of blood. Um, because uh, there had been such a humanitarian crisis related to the partition. And I don't know if the partition was a good idea or not. You know, I don't know if um, you would have had these same conflicts if you did try to just build a multi-religious India uh, or whether it would have been worse. It's, it's hard to second guess. We do know how it played out and it didn't play out well. Um, so, uh, in, in actuality, Gandhi, uh, tragically, uh, despite being one of the most respected figures of the 20th century, he actually winds up dying of an assassin's bullet by a Hindu extremist who thought that, uh, who resented Gandhi for being too protective of Muslims because Gandhi was saying, hey, you know, Gandhi was kind of taking the whole we should all get along, we should not be killing each other thing. And, uh, and Gandhi was Hindu, but he, he respected the Muslim civil rights and, and didn't want the violence. And uh, for that, uh, he paid the price of actually being assassinated by a radical Hindu. Um, so, uh, so Gandhi kind of met his, uh, met his fate, uh, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, one of the real flashpoints was the region known as Kashmir, which sits on the, uh, India-Pakistan border. Um, Kashmir, also, uh, the, the title of, like, the one good Led Zeppelin song. Uh, but, uh, Kashmir, uh, was a region that, uh, basically is underneath, uh, the British Imperial government. You had had all these kind of regional princes that were still allowed to kind of rule subject to the British. And, uh, the, Kashmir happened to be a region that two-thirds of the population was Muslim, but the ruler was Hindu. So the the and the princes had a lot of say in whether their region went with India or went with Pakistan. So the Hindu ruler wanted uh, Kashmir to be a part of India, but most of the people were Muslim and wanted it to be a part of Pakistan. And uh, so the solution is war, and not just once or twice, but repeatedly. There have been multiple wars fought over the region of Kashmir between India and Pakistan. Um, some as recently as, uh, I think as recently as the 1990s. Um, and, uh, you know, there was, there was fighting in the 40s, uh, but then it, it picks back up at random times. Uh, you know, 1984, there was a flare-up a bunch of different times. There's been several different India-Pakistan conflicts related to Kashmir. At one point in time, there's a sidebar in your book called The Coldest War uh, on page 999 uh, that talks about one uh, time where India and Pakistan actually went to fighting over, with guns, I mean actual fighting, like war fighting, uh, over uh, a glacier uh, that's in the Kashmir region that when they d divided everything up, they didn't even bother to divide the glacier because they thought no one would try to claim it because it was so high in the air, it was so cold and frigid. Uh, and, um, but evidently Pakistan believed that, you know, if India were to try to cut off uh, the flow of the water from the snow melt, that it would have been a problem for their water supply. Uh, and so they wind up going to fight over this glacial mountain and they're like down in the fighting each other in trenches while the temperature is dropping 70 degrees below zero at times. Do you understand what 70 below zero means? Imagine the difference between a 70 degree day and a zero degree day. Then start from zero and think it gets that much colder. Uh, that's a big deal. Um, and yet they, they still were fighting over, over this piece of, uh, you know, frozen uh, mountain. So uh, the first prime minister of India is a man by the name of Jawa, Jawa, Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, 
And uh, Nehru is famous as uh, the leader of the so-called non-aligned movement, which was uh, a alliance of countries that kind of wanted to take a neutral uh, stance in the Cold War and tried to either, they wanted to not be beholden to either the United States or the Soviet Union uh, and kind of wanted to kind of plot their own way. So that's one of Nero's most famous things on the world stage was kind of starting this kind of non-aligned movement. Domestically, you know, uh, India, because India overnight became, they'd adopted a democratic form of government. Um, so they did have free elections and stuff from the jump. Uh, but, and they overnight became the largest democracy in the world. The very first day they were an independent country, they gained that distinction. Um, cause they are the second uh, largest country in the world by population and one of the, maybe the third or fourth largest by area. So, the, I mean, they're a major, uh, you know, a major population center in the world. Uh, Nehru, uh, unfortunately, uh, was, you know, one of these many post-colonial leaders that was kind of smitten with socialism. And so India's economy gets off on a bad foot. They, they start off. Uh, was socializing a lot of things. I mean, that was kind of the trend outside of the United States. Even the Western European countries we mentioned, you know, adopted, you know, kind of democratic socialist type uh, governments with extraordinarily high welfare states and, and so on. Uh, and so the Indian economy stagnated really bad, um, which left them, you know, with, uh, you know, severe poverty for decades. Um, you know, uh, lots of people starving in the street. There's lots of homeless in India. In recent years, the last 10, 20 years, India has kind of turned things around, and they're actually kind of a nation on the rise. Um, they've got uh, a growing upper class. Now, there's still a lot of poverty in India, a lot of crushing poverty in parts of India. But, um, you know, but they are experiencing pretty wide economic growth, and I expect that India is going to become one of it's already sort of becoming one of them, but I expect India is going to become one of the most important nations in the world uh, in the 21st century, you know, if they continue, um, you know, uh, free market economics and so on. Although um, right now they're dealing with the struggle of kind of some resurgent Hindu nationalism that's causing some unrest um, in inside of the nation. Um, so you have uh, Nehru's daughter, uh, uh, Indira Gandhi, actually becomes the second prime minister of India. So, you know, uh, that kind of messes with, you know, what, you know, some people's stereotypes might be. They actually wound up picking a, a female prime minister second. Um, but, uh, and, uh, you know, Gandhi ruled pretty well, had some challenges though. Uh, some Sikh extremists wanted a, a Sikh state, um, that, and that led to some violence. Um, you know, and then uh, from there, uh, the leadership passed to her son, uh, Rajiv Gandhi. So, uh, you know, it's funny that they kind of had a little bit of a of an accidental dynasty, even though they had democratic elections. Uh, you know, that that one family um, had significant um, uh, say in consecutive administrations. One thing that uh, happens that's a big deal is because in the midst of all the tension with Pakistan, India goes nuclear, um, and they actually. Uh, they, I think they were the first uh, country outside of the United States and Europe to develop nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, this spurred Pakistan to develop nuclear weapons as well. Um, and, um, you know, there was an infamous figure named A.Q. Khan that was uh, involved in helping uh, nuclearize Pakistan, who had some terrorist ties and so on. Um, and Pakistan going nuclear uh, is really terrifying because, you know, the Pakistani state has typically not been a very strong one or has not always been able to completely con gain control over all areas of that country. And there's extremist elements, you know, that we would associate with some of the Muslim terror groups and stuff uh, in a lot of parts of Pakistan. So the fact that the Pakistani government is a nuclear power is frankly just... Uh, um, uh, disconcerting, I guess might be the word I'm, I'm looking for. You, you kind of wish that wasn't the case. But uh, but the, the Pakistanis developed it largely out of defense because India had developed nuclear weapons and there was such a rivalry between those two countries. Um, but meanwhile, Pakistan gets off to a rough start as well. First off, Eastern, the whole East Pakistan, West Pakistan dynamic does not work out well because what happens is uh, because the, most of the land and, and uh, more than half the population was in uh, West Pakistan. West Pakistan really emerged as 
uh, the more dominant region. And uh, the th problem is East Pakistan uh, is in the midst of, uh, it's in the midst of the worst monsoons in, in the world. They have terrible monsoons with um, every single year, just about. And uh, it's part of why their economy can't uh, really get on off the, onto the right foot. They're having to constantly re rebuild from typhoons and tidal waves and stuff. So uh, anyway, they have this terrible typhoon comes in. I keep saying monsoon, but I think I'm, I'm trying to say typhoon. They have this terrible typhoon come in, causes a major humanitarian crisis. A lot of the Western countries send lots, you know, millions of dollars of aid to help, you know, rebuild uh, East Pakistan because it was so, such a bad situation. And uh, the West Pakistanis kept a lot of the money and didn't actually give it to the people that needed it, which caused riots in the streets in East Pakistan. And ultimately, it leads to a civil war between the two. And, of course, India is in... India does not like a civil war breaking out between these two Pakistans because they're right in the middle of it because they're, the two regions were separated by the nation of India. So India actually winds up in an attempt to kind of get everything stabilized. They, uh, they actually wind up to, in an attempt to um, hurt Pakistan, who had become their rival. Um, they actually side with East Pakistan in their war, and East Pakistan wins independence, uh, and they take the name Bangladesh. So the country of Bangladesh was formerly a part of Pakistan. Now it's its own thing. And Bangladesh, again, one of the more poor countries in the world, kind of kind of rough place in some ways. Um, uh, Pakistan has a series of leaders. You don't need to look at all of them. Uh, one of the most famous ones was a woman by the name of Benazir Bhutto. Uh, who had been uh, uh, an elected prime minister. She was overthrown by a military coup that kind of temporarily ended Pakistan as a democracy. Then they, they were, uh, and the guy that replaced him was a guy named uh, Pervez Musharraf, uh, and he's important to American history because he was a, an important figure in uh, dealing with the whole war on terror and, and Afghan war thing. Uh, but he was he was a terrible person. We didn't we never really truly knew whether to trust him or not. Supposedly on our side, but sometimes it you know, did things to make us question that. Um, anyway, Musharraf. Uh, ultimately, there there are um, there's pressure to like restore democracy, and Budo gets reelected again, and then she gets assassinated. Um, and um, so uh, another country that gets independence in this part of the world. Uh, is the small island country of Sri Lanka. It's just off the coast of India. And probably the most famous thing happening in Sri Lanka uh, is the civil war connected to uh, the Tamil people. Um, and there is a uh, famous terrorist organization known as the Tamil Tigers. And the Tamil Tigers were there to kind of advocate for Tamil independence from Sri Lanka. Uh, meanwhile, the first country to actually, the first of the uh, colonies to really gain independence in Asia was actually uh, America's one major colony in Asia, the Philippines. Um, and of course, you remember, you know, we had even fought at one point, um, right at, around the time of World War One-ish, you know, we had fought this uh, insurrection, um, you know, against... Uh, Filipino uh, rebels led by Aguinaldo that wanted independence. Uh, we ultimately promised that they would eventually get it. And we did give it to them after World War II, although we did demand certain interests, like we, you know, we signed a treaty that gave them independence can, uh, dependent on uh, having free trade for a period of time and giving us rights to some naval bases. Uh, eventually, we had to abandon those in like the, the 70s or so. Um, but uh, those bases were an important part of the Korea and Vietnam wars at times. Uh, so, um, in 1965, so the the Philippine the Filipino government was still kind of dependent on the U.S. for a little while. 1965, uh, a fellow is elected by the name of Ferdinand Marcos, and Ferdinand Marcos turns the country into a dictatorship and and becomes quite the crook. He he steals like 400 plus million dollars uh, from the taxpayers for his own personal use. 
his wife, Imelda Marcos, is infamous as the shoe lady because she, uh, while most Filipinos were, uh, you know, were pretty poor um, and didn't have very much, uh, she, using money stolen from taxpayers, uh, had closets with literally thousands of pairs of uh, the most expensive designer shoes in the world, never wore the same pair of shoes twice, just about. Um, and so she became kind of infamous in her country for doing that while everyone else is starving to death. Uh, and she did all that with their stolen money. Um, Marcos rules the Philippines for a long time uh, until like the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and then he is deposed uh, and is replaced by, um, I believe, uh, Corazon Aquino, who was the uh, wife of uh, a man named Aquino who had been uh, one of the uh, main uh, spokesman for opposition to Marcos, and he had been assassinated. And so after Marcos is overthrown, uh, the, you know, the, the anti-Marcos leader's widow actually becomes the Filipino president. Um, and the Philippines are a majority Catholic country, although they do have a Protestant minority, but they also have a Muslim minority. That Muslim minority caused, um, uh, caused uh, a civil war with some Islamic terror groups, um, that raged uh, in the 2000s, 90s and 2000s. I'm not sure if it's still going or not. Um, right now, the Philippines, uh, although they have a, they, they are a democracy, they do have elections, but they elected a guy named Duterte um, who is off his rocker and, uh, you know, really doing some pretty dictatorial things. But he's like extreme police state. Like they declared this like uh, really draconian uh policies of, of crime where, I mean, um, and, and taking away a lot of, you know, civil rights and rights to trial and stuff like that to where, um, you know, they've had the military just like, if people, not even people who are dealers, but people who would like drug addicts and stuff, just mowing them down in the streets and stuff. So Duterte is a little, he's a little uh, off his rocker. But um, Malaysia gets their independence from Britain uh, back there in uh, the 60s, uh, as does Burma. Burma winds up becoming a military dictatorship for most of its time. Um, there was a d democracy leader named Aung Sun Kuki who became, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that name right, but she became kind of a uh, international celebrity in the uh, kind of peace and human rights worlds for a long time, and then she actually became president and kind of disappointed everybody by continuing to do uh, the th things that the old regime uh, did. Um, uh, the, t the island nation of Singapore uh, was originally a part of Malaysia. They get their independence um, and they kind of exist as a city-state. It's a nation basically of one city on an island, but they actually, despite being very small, are extraordinarily high-tech and have one of the strongest economies in the world. They're like one of the, the richest countries in the world. Um, also, very little grass there. There's so little grass left in Singapore from all the development that they literally, like, made a park around, like, one of the last patches of grass to where, like, you can't even walk on it. You just have to be able to, like, look at it and be like, oh, remember what grass looked like. Um, which is a little, a little excessive, uh, in my view, but, um, Indonesia... Uh, got their uh, independence from the Dutch. They came under the leadership of a fellow by the name of Sukarno. Um, there was a little bit of a civil war uh, related to the East Timor region of Indonesia. Um, so then, moving our attention from uh, Asia to Africa, uh, there is uh, a growing push for African independence. Uh, a lot of uh, people in Africa start, um, kind of start a movement to, uh, oppose imperialism coming into World War II. Uh, the support that some African troops, uh, lent to World War II fighting in the British and French armies kind of helps their case and kind of helps gain sympathy for the independence movements, along with, as I said, just the fact that Britain and France were kind of past their prime as world powers. Uh, if you remember, when we talked about African imperialism in a previous chapter, we said basically countries had taken one of two approaches to African colonies, either direct rule or indirect rule. Indirect rule was where the local governments uh, 
still kind of ruled things on the ground subject to the imperial power. Direct rule was where they were ruled by bureaucrats from London or Paris or wherever else. When the countries start to get their independence, uh, the countries that had indirect rule started to do a lot better. The countries that had direct rule, they hadn't, they literally hadn't had any government of their own in, uh, you know, 75, 80 years. Uh, and they, and so therefore, um, it was a kind of a mess when they had to put one together. The indirect, uh, rule countries did a little bit better for themselves, but, uh, Africa really struggles. Uh, throughout the 20th century. There's starting to be a little bit of a turnaround in Africa. Things are doing a little bit better uh, even than they were 10, 12 years ago. Um, you know, but nonetheless, uh, you know, Africa's had a pretty turbulent um, existence with a lot of civil war, a lot of unstable governments that get overthrown a lot. Uh, you'll see that's kind of a pattern in African history. There's a lot of still old tribal rivalries that that um, pop up from time to time and at times have led to genocide in the case of the Hutus and Tutsis in Rwanda or some of the uh, fighting in the Sudan so uh, a lot of uh, a lot of um, unfortunate events and we'll come we'll come back is and actually kind of look at um, the more recent decades of Africa next week but <clears throat> um, but for now, kind of we'll talk a little bit about how, how independence happens. So there's a couple different ways that independence happen. There's some colonies that win independence, uh, you know, through political lobbying. And then there's some that actually have to fight for it. There's a handful of times where, you know, the European power put its foot down and said, we're not going to leave, and they had to fight uh, an armed conflict. Uh, the first uh, colony in sub-Saharan Africa uh, to gain independence was the British colony of Gold Coast. Um, and, uh, the leader, there was a nonviolent movement, uh, to get, uh, independence for the Gold Coast. It was led by a man by the name of Kwame Nkrumah. And, uh, they started to do strikes, boycotts, kind of followed a little bit of the Gandhi model. Uh, in 1957, Gold Coast was given independence and they chose to name themselves Ghana, which if you remember earlier in the year, we talked about the three great African empires of what was considered the medieval era in, in from a western perspective the three great uh, african empires of the medieval era were the ghana the mali and the songhai um you'll notice that ghana becomes a country here in 57 and then mali is also going to become a country uh in the near future they mali had been a french colony um, no one at present has taken the name songhai back but um <clears throat> so uh Nkrumah becomes the first prime minister of Ghana and becomes the president for life so uh he doesn't uh you know face re-election all the time he basically was given the the presidency until he died uh and Nkrumah's first thing he does is he starts a major building building project trying to uh you know build up and improve the schools the hospitals a lot of the infrastructure which sounds good but he spent way too much money doing it and the cost of those projects basically crippled the Ghanaian economy it was ne never able to really get off on the right foot um you know and uh you know there you know uh Ghana's one of many countries where they've had the problem of you know they start to attract like a little bit of western investment and then you know some regime decides to go seize some land or whatever and then people don't want to go invest there again um but uh Nkrumah was overthrown in a coup in 1966 uh, Nkrumah was a major leader of, of a kind of uh, a movement they called Pan-Africanism, uh, which was the idea of kind of um, uniting the African countries in, in solidarity in certain issues. Um, and uh, a lot of the Ghanaians thought that Nkrumah was spending too much time on those sort of Pan-African pursuits instead of actually running the country. So he's away in China on a diplomatic mission in 66, and while he's gone, uh, there is a military overthrow. And so since then, Ghana's gone back and forth between uh, military regime, civilian regime, military regime, civilian regime, over and over. Um, Another country that uh, gained independence from Britain, this one involved some warfare to accomplish it, uh, was Kenya. And um, uh, a lot of uh, Kenya, unlike some of the other African countries that had a lot of British settlers that lived there, uh, and they did not want Kenya to get independence. This is going to be a little bit of a foreshadowing of, of what happens in South Africa that causes the terrible apartheid uh, situation. Uh, but so you have, an, you know, enough uh, British settlers in Kenya that did not want 
uh, a lot of them had set up farmlands and stuff like that, and they didn't want Kenya to get independence because they thought they would be forced out or, or uh, hurt. Um, so they, uh, uh, but ultimately, uh, two things happened that forced the British to ultimately give um, Kenya self-government. One was uh, the strong leadership of a fellow by the name of Jomo Kenyatta, uh, who was uh, a major leader for Kenyan self-determination. And the second uh, was the rise of a group known as the Mau Mau, which was uh, the Mau Mau Rebellion was a secret, they basically were a secret society uh, of mainly um, Kenyan herdsmen and, and uh, farmers who resented the fact that the British, you know, far farmers had set up shop and taken a lot of the good land. And so the Mau Mau started attacking uh, the British uh, settlers. Uh, this leads to uh, this leads to a uh, fairly brutal guerrilla war uh, in Kenya uh, that cost 10,000 Kenyans their lives, along with uh, 100 British settlers. And of course, that's a so literally 10 times as many, many Kenyans died as did British. But ultimately, uh, in Kenyatta was never officially proven to have been connected to the Mau Mau, but he also refused to condemn them. So Kenyatta, the British responded by putting Kenyatta in prison for a period of time. Uh, finally, uh, <clears throat> Britain concedes, uh, gives Kenya their independence. Kenyatta becomes the first president. And, you know, Kenya, I mean, again, like most African countries, has, has some poverty and stuff, but Kenya is actually uh, one of the relatively better off African countries. They do have some modern cities like the capital city of Nairobi. Uh, they do have some uh, decent universities. A lot of, um, uh, you know, the smartest people of Africa try to go to university in Kenya. <clears throat> um, and so they've got a little bit of an economy. Uh, you know, is there still some poverty? Yes. Um, of course, I mean, there's still poverty everywhere. Uh, but Kenya's a little bit better off than, than some African nations are. Um, again, very, very relative. I mean, you know, certainly you would probably not want the average Kenyan's economic position. But um, So meanwhile, Algeria has to fight for independence from France. Uh, France... Um, you know, France actually does try to hold on to parts of their empire a little, uh, you know, a little bit. We already talked in a previous lecture about uh, the French losing control of the Asian colony of Indochina at the Battle of Dinh Binh Phu, which is, of course, the battle that fuels the rise of Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. French Indochina splits into Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. Uh, but and, and just as they try to hold on in Southeast Asia, uh, they also tried to hold on in Northwest Africa, uh, out there in the desert. Um, Algeria had actually attracted a lot of French colonists. There were about one million like uh, Frenchmen that lived in Algeria uh, alongside nine million uh, Arabs and Berber Muslims. So uh, after World War II, the colonists refused to share power with the Algerians. The natives started to say, we should have more of a say in the government and not just the French run everything. Um, but the French didn't really go along with that. So in 1954, they start the Algerian National Liberation Front, or the FLN, and they announced the uh, goal of fighting for independence um, under the leadership of a man by the name of Ahmed Ben Bella. Uh, ben Bella, and they ultimately that man becomes the first president of a newly independent Algeria in 1962, uh, makes it into uh, a socialist government for a long time uh, and then in the 1990s you started to have more of an Islamic fundamentalist kind of al-Qaeda sympathetic you know faction that wanted to make it into like a Sharia law state or whatever and so now there's been kind of been fighting between um, the government and Islamic militants for a while. Uh, of course if you remember the Belgian Congo was one of the worst spots for African imperialism um, Belgium, Belgium finally grants independence uh, to the Congo in 1960. Uh, from the period of 71 to 77, uh, the country of Congo briefly took the name of Zaire. Um, and uh, the leader of Zaire during this time was a man by the name of Mobutu Sese Soko. And uh, Mobutu uh, is actually the one he, who renames the country Zaire for a period of time. Um, once again, he was a crook and uh, a dictator um, one party rule, uh, fought against several rebellions, um, you know, killed an awful lot of folks. Um, there was also a war in Angola, which gained their, uh, independence from Portugal. Uh, 
Uh, Angola at some point actually becomes a communist country. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of conflict that comes to Africa. We're going to visit some more of it next week as we wrap up. Um, one thing that happens is both uh, there's a couple different campaigns of genocide that, that happen in, in some of these newly uh, decolonizing uh, countries in East Africa, especially as we get into um, the 90s and 2000s. In the 1990s, uh, there was a major incident in uh, a region known as Rwanda, uh, where uh, in Rwanda there were kind of two main tribes, the Hutus and the Tutsis, and they had hated each other for hundreds of years, um, you know, and they wound up in the same country when, you know, the maps are redrawn largely with European interest involved, you know. And so uh, in the spring of 94, the Rwandan president, who was a Hutu, dies in a plane crash. Uh, and after that happens, uh, the the, two, uh, the Hutus start slaughtering uh, Tutsis, who I guess they blame for it. They wind up killing a million Tutsis. Um, and then uh, ultimately, you know, the, they have to bring in a UN tribunal to punish some of the worst of it and all this kind of stuff. There's some... Um, you and peacekeeping troops wind up getting involved. In 2004, uh, the government of the Sudan had been a kind of a uh, militantly Islamic regime, uh, and they had already they had had a long running war against kind of the the southern part of the Sudan Sudan, which is um, largely Christian with some animist, which is you know, nature worshippers, or whatever. Um, and that had already been a conflict through the 90s, but then in the 2000s they kind of turned their attention on another Muslim uh, another Muslim region. Um, uh, known as the Darfur, and for whatever reason, um, they uh, really committed some just absolute humanitarian atrocities in Darfur that are, um, you know, some of which is just unspeakable. Um, and they would, uh, you know, come in and just slaughter and pillage and, and do all kinds of terrible things to the cities there. Um, you know, we wound up putting sanctions on the Sudanese government over it and, and different things. So, um, Africa has some, has some struggles, uh, in the years after independence. Um, Asia has had a few struggles too over the years, but you know, they, some of these Asian countries are turning around they're actually becoming, uh, very, you know, strong economies. And, and, uh, you know, if you look at, um, you know, this was more, lesson was more about the, you know, the countries that are getting gaining independence but uh you know if you look a lot of the other asian countries like japan and south korea that had already had independence uh have have developed into very uh sophisticated modern economies that uh with often pretty wealthy populations so um anyway uh that's it for today happy cinco de mayo uh and uh i suppose i'll see you soon